voices that we hear. One of the reasons that we have the 12 days of Christmas is it marks the stories of the infancy and the young childhood of Christ. After the baby was born, one of the traditions was that the baby should be taken to the temple in Jerusalem and be blessed and named. It is speculated that Simeon, the man who had waited for years and years to see the face of Christ, was not actually on duty, although he was probably a priest of the temple. And yet the Spirit moved him, and he went to the temple anyway, and there he encountered the one that had been promised to him. Again, as we said earlier, not coming as a great judge, or a mighty warrior, or a prince, but as a baby in the arms of parents who came to seek a blessing and a naming for their son. The parents were faithful, but they were not rich. They probably had to work to gather the money to pay for the offering of the two turtle doves at the temple. And there was Simeon who gathered up this child and recognized that not this mighty adult coming, but this child was the promise, fulfilled and made incarnate and held in his arms. What we don't hear in this passage is that Simeon had doubted for a period of time and been made quiet. And that his voice came back to him when he met the Christ child. And that voice was offered up to God and then to the Holy Family. He was a prophet in his day and in his way. Anna, too, is one of the powerful women that we hear about in the stories of Luke. She is in the lineage of Mary and Elizabeth, proclaiming the goodness and the power of God to her people. In point of fact, she actually lives at the temple non-stop. She prays night and day, and she fasts. She lives a very faithful, practiced, disciplined life. And maybe that's part of what got her to her venerable 84 years of age, that she has been so careful and so focused on one great purpose, and her voice goes out to the people of the community from the temple, and she is talking about the arrival of God among them. Hope is here. Hope is now. It is held in the arms of Simeon, squirming and crying and wanting hope to be nourished and held and comforted, reaching out for us, Wanting to connect. Part of the invitation of this season is will we reach back? Will we take up a love that is so vulnerable in its promise and hold it close to us and love all that it means to love in a mortal body? So many of us know very deeply what that means. And even God asks us to draw that close and believe that God's self loves us enough not to come as an impenetrable Greek God, but as a small and vulnerable child who will grow up to be the man that inspires the ministry and blesses the followers and does the great commissioning, calling out to people to break open their own bodies and their own hearts and share that love down through generations. In a commissioning, in a blessing that began 2,000 years ago and flows into this room and continues among us. The breaking open of that body began 
when a mother gave birth and a child was born and a family traveled to Jerusalem and handed over their baby to somebody else. And in that child, the face of God was visible and the love of God was tangible and it would go on to change the world. <coughs> voices spoke 2,000 years ago, but there are voices speaking in the world today, and I would ask you, when are our voices too quiet? When do our voices need to be raised? Where are you called to speak and speak truth, even if it's hard, even if it's risky, when you too are the hands and feet and heart and mind of God in this world? And I offer you two examples of people who have raised their voice. One comes from our own country, from the Sioux people in Standing Rock. No matter where you might fall on the environmental question of a pipeline and clean water, the people in Standing Rock have voiced their concern over the impact of that pipeline on their lands and in the sacred waters that are theirs to care for. And what has been inspiring is how many people have been moved from across this nation to go and join their camp and stand with them over time. Veterans who came back from many wars and felt disenfranchised Veterans who didn't have the money to buy the bus ticket to get to the camp found a way. And they told all of their friends to donate money to the cause and not to them. Because in that call for people to stand and put their bodies in harm's way and stand up for justice, people who felt that they had been cut off from their own community suddenly found a sense of purpose again. In the same way, the elders of the Sioux people who were trying to pray at different sites and were being interrupted in their prayers communicated with different people of faith and 500 people, clergy from all kinds of faiths, came and again stood with the elders. Not in acts of violence, but in acts of sacred prayer, raising their voices to God, to love, to justice, to creation, <clears throat> saying this is something that is worth standing up for. And we believe we can make a difference, at least for this one day. And that if enough people hear our voices and see our bodies, perhaps things will change. Most of the people that have come to the cry of Standing Rock are adults. But what is it like to be a child in a world that is out of your control? where the things that should be your own right and privilege are taken away from you. There was a little girl living in Pakistan. She came from an educated family, although her own mother cannot read. She herself was learning to read and attending school. When the Taliban began to ban girls' education, and to prove their point, they blew up no less than 200 girls' schools. Frightening children into staying home, trying to force families into a way that did not open a path of liberation and thought and reflection and hope for whole families. This little girl happened to be connected to a father who is himself 
an outspoken person. But at the age of 10, when her own schooling was taken away from her, she began blogging within a year or two of that for the BBC under a pen name. Too soon, her identity was disclosed, and she was under a death threat from the Taliban. But she kept speaking out and writing and blogging for the rights of girls and children to go to school and learn and think for themselves and make a difference in the world. And one day, a warrior from the Taliban boarded the school bus that she was riding and asked, Who here is Malala? None of the children revealed her identity, but all it took was the flick of some eyes, and he knew who was Malala. And he shot her three times in the head in 2012. I believe that most of you know that she survived that attack, and that as opposed to silencing it, her voice, it brought back her voice and drew even more attention to the rights and privileges of education. And that out of that experience, her story was published and told over and over again in so many languages. And so many other children, girls and boys, were inspired to understand that you don't have to wait till you're an adult to use your voice to change the world. And that even when somebody tries to silence your voice, your voice is more powerful than that act of violence. Just last year, she won the Nobel Peace Prize. She's the youngest ever to receive it. And the only thing that she wishes for her attacker is that she had been able to reason with him. And to say to him, I could be your sister. I could be your daughter. I want nothing more than what they want. And what children and girls and boys all over the world want, which is access to education. And the chance to raise their voices and tell their stories and be recognized as human beings across all differences of faith and culture and language and gender. One of the greatest gifts that's come out of Malala's experience is that her mother is learning to read so that she can read the book that her daughter wrote. The voices that were angels and working shepherds and wise people and two worried parents and a crying child have resounded for 2,000 years. And God is bigger than our labels and the spirit is more creative than our boxes and our definitions and moves in places that we didn't think could happen. That spirit invites us to speak and fills even our sacred silence with something that is there to restore us and give us purpose and hope. That voice is speaking across the centuries and into the lives of the people that are called to stand at Standing Rock or a child who defies the Taliban and continues to tell her story. We all have tongues. And if we're fortunate, we have the privilege of being able to use our throats and our voices. We know there are those who cannot. And sometimes our task is to speak for those who can't and act for those who are not able. In the year to come, let us not 
be overwhelmed by the news of things like the events at Istanbul. Let us pay attention to those things, but let us believe that we are the bearers of light. And that light is in our throats and in our tongues and in our voices raised. God is still speaking through us. And the question today is, what will God say through your life and your being in this world? Thanks be to God.